Revelation 2, 1 through 6, King James Version today reads, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. I know thy works and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars, and hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember therefore from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of his place, except thou repent. Talking to us for a while today on the topic, the three R's of love. Ooh, I got to tell you, the Lord's asking me these days to go through quite a trial. I've been through trials before. You know, Bill, just because the children of Israel got to, got through the Red Sea, that was early in their journey. That didn't mean that there weren't additional miracles needed along the way, and I tell the truth. Yeah. I'm going to tell you, sometimes God allows us to go through things so that we are reminded that all along the way, we can never lose sight of the fact that we must rely on Him. He reminds us with every trial and every hardship and every difficulty that it is a dangerous thing to become so comfortable in life that we think we can do it alone. Oh God, I'll tell you what, I know I, I went through near death in 2000 and now I'm not afraid of dying. That's not the issue at hand at the moment anyway. <laughs> But I struggle so much with strength and with fatigue and with feeling so tired. And people don't realize, that I guess, or they don't care one, I don't know. Sometimes this preacher feels like they're in the soul in the universe that cares. I'm going to be honest with you. I, have, I still... I've been in Dallas almost 18 years. I still have to go out and work in order to pay my bills. I've known a lot of pastors started a lot of churches. I've never known a pastor that started a church and 18 years later, he still didn't have enough support in the church so that he could devote his energy full time to the work that he was doing. I get so tired, it's not even funny. I come home, sometimes I come home and I'm raging. And I'm being honest. I'm not going to stand up here and lie to you. I'm, I'm being as honest as I can. I'm raging. I'm, I'm, I'm so frustrated and aggravated that poor Tommy just has to stand there and listen to me just rant on. Because I'm exhausted, John. I don't mean tired. I'm not to, I wish it was tired. I wish that's all I felt was tired, but I don't feel tired. I feel literally like somebody has just taken me and wrung me out like a rag. And it doesn't matter how much I beg and plead all mine for support and ask people to love us and help us. They don't. They don't. So you notice today I didn't bother. I didn't say a word. I'm not going to waste my energy. I'm not going to waste my breath. Years ago, while I was pastoring a, an affirming work in Connecticut for about a year, year and a half, before I went through that 
experienced some nearly dying, the Spirit of the Lord gave me a sermon, a message, and He told me that that message was for my ministry. It was not necessarily about the church in Connecticut as much as it was about my ministry, period. I preached a message about being a rose in the midst of a desert or in the midst of a wilderness. You see, John the Baptist was a rose in the wilderness. He was out there in the middle of the wilderness. I mean to tell you, there wasn't no comforts. There wasn't nothing around him that was convenient or helpful. But that's where God sent him to minister. And if people were going to hear John, they had to find a way to get out to the wilderness to hear him. Because he didn't come into the city and preach on the streets. He didn't preach where the people were, where his supporters were. No, he was in one of the most inopportune, uncomfortable environments that anybody could be in. The Spirit of the Lord spoke to me and told me, he said, that's where I'm sending you. That's where I'm sending. Well, guess what, Johnny? I finally figured it out after 25 years of affirming ministry. I finally figured out that's where I've been living for an awful lot of years. You know why John wore camel's hair, which was the most uncomfortable stuff you could wear? You know why John ate locusts and wild honey? Because... Uh, he didn't have a whole lot of money and he didn't have a whole lot of support and he didn't have a whole lot of resources. Well, I got news for you. I understand. I'm going to tell you a little secret. And God forgive me if somebody out there wants to say, oh, this preacher, he's a narcissist. He's full of himself. I don't mean it that way by any means, but I'm going to tell you something. We got, we got messages come off this pulpit that every Christian in America needs to hear. Yeah, amen. We've got words that come from the Lord out of this little tiny Tennessee work in Dallas, Texas that multitudes need to hear. Sure. Absolutely. Drives me crazy sometimes. I feel like I'm the most useless, worthless. I feel like I'm about as effective as a lawnmower engine trying to move a tank. Believe it or not, what I've just said plays into my message today. People spend millions of dollars and untold hours looking for the secrets to making love last. Marriages which have grown cold and couples who have grown apart often seek out instruction as to how they might once again find the levels of love and romance, passion that they once knew. Many in the church today are not even aware of the fact that their relationship with the Lord has drastically changed and not for the better. It is not today what it once was and it certainly is not what it was in the beginning. Amen. How in the world do we get back to that place where our love for God, our love for the Lord was new and fresh, vibrant and passionate? You remember when we were kids and went to school, they said you go to school to learn the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. Well, of course, they, whoever said that didn't know how to spell. <laughs> Because arithmetic starts with an A, but that's all right. We knew the three R's. We went to school to study the three R's. But there are three R's today that help us in matters of love. The Word of God says in Revelation chapter 2, Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords, is speaking to the church in Ephesus. The same church that Paul the Apostle wrote an epistle to. And he praises the church. In verse 2 he said, I know thy works, I know your deeds, I know your actions. And thy labor, 
I understand the things you've done specifically on my behalf and on behalf of the kingdom of God. Oh, I'm going to tell you today, I thank God that when nobody on this planet seems to give a hair what I'm doing or what I'm trying to do for the Lord, I'm so glad God knows. Amen. Whew. Amen. I'm so glad somebody gets it. I'm so glad... Somebody understands what I'm going through and what I'm trying to do. I'm so glad somebody understands that if I drop dead in this pulpit preaching this message to an LGBT and non-LGBT audience trying to help people reconcile their relationship with God and walk in communion with the Holy Ghost, I know God that I've poured out my life for the work that I'm trying to do. This is not a game to me by any stretch of the imagination. I'm not playing. If I were playing games, if I were trying to earn a living, if I were trying to do things for money, honey, I could have given this mess up ages ago. Ages ago. I'm talking decades ago. Because it became obvious awful quick, awful quick, that support was... <laughs> nearly impossible to find. Get people that come into this church and they stay a year, two years, five years. We've had people stay eight years. We've been here 18. And then they find a boyfriend, a girlfriend, whatever they find, and poof, Johnny, they're gone in a moment's notice. Because although the pastor can't afford to be that flighty and can't afford to just pick up and disappear and leave at a moment's notice like that. They can. So their support bill is so fleeting. Here today, gone tomorrow. And yet the preacher has to find the encouragement somewhere, somehow, to keep going and to keep pressing on. And I'm so glad God sees everything. Some people out there online, you struggle, you fight, you wrestle. You're, some of you are trying to do a work for God in your own lives, in your own communities. And you feel sometimes like nobody's paying attention. I want to remind you of Revelation chapter 2. The Lord said, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. God knows. God sees. If there's not a soul in this world that gives a happy hallelujah about anything you're doing, God understands. Amen. Said, I know thy works and thy labor and thy patience. Oh, Lord. What you think is patience is nothing short of sheer stubbornness. I'm just too stubborn to quit. Because believe me, as much as I try to be patient and wait on things to happen, my patience runs thin all too often. The Lord said, And how thou canst not bear them which are evil. The Bible said in the last days they'd call good evil and evil good. Uh-huh. I'm going to tell you something. If there's a man on this planet, a Christian on this planet, can't stand evil men, you're looking at him right here. I can't stand these political types, I'm going to put it that way, who call themselves the representation of God. They call themselves the representatives of God. They call themselves the bastions of holiness. They call themselves the bulwark of morality. And yet they demonize and call people on the other side of the aisle everything short of Satan in the flesh. Call them evil, call them ungodly, call them immoral. When, interestingly enough, the people on the other side of the aisle embrace a platform <laughs> that looks a lot more biblical and Christ-like to my vision than the one they embrace. They don't want to deal with 
People are seeking asylum. They don't want to deal with immigrants. They don't want to deal with the poor. They don't want to deal with the oppressed. They don't want to deal with injustice. Oh, but they're good. And the other side says, no, we want to embrace the poor. We want to help the sick. We want to embrace those who are seeking asylum. We want to welcome those who come to our country to make a better life. Only God knows what contribution they might make to this nation one day. That's right. But we've got the evil ones, I'm going to say it plain, calling the good ones evil. Am I telling the truth? Yes. And we've got people in our country... <laughs> who are so blind, and, and those of you that watch us online, y'all, if you don't know it yet, then you're going to know it today. I use plain language because I don't have time to screw around. I, I, these preachers get up and waste all their breath trying to walk around stuff instead of saying what they got to say. Then we got these idiots at the grassroots level who sit there, I had an aunt send me a message the other day, an aunt by marriage. Stop peeking on Trump! The Democrats are the evil ones! And with all the godliness I could muster, I wrote her back a message and said, You're an idiot. I did. I said, you're an idiot. And then I unfriended her from Facebook and I blocked her. Because I don't have time to deal with anyone who is so mentally unbalanced and so psychotic and stupid that they cannot tell good from evil. And God knows this to be true. He said, I know thy works and thy labor, and thy patience, listen, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil. Just because you wrap yourself in a sheep's wool doesn't make you a sheep. That's right. The Bible said there'd be plenty of false prophets who were nothing but wolves in sheep's clothing. I got news for you, honey. There are a lot of false saints, a lot of false Christians, a lot of false believers who have wrapped themselves in wool and go bah, bah, and they are no more sheep than anything because sheep follow the shepherd. They don't lead the shepherd. But listen to this. The Lord also said, And how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. How many people in this stupid world of ours today buy into the idea that every preacher on TV who has a viewership in the millions or tens of millions that they speak with authority from God that is unmatched and unrivaled because after all look at all the people who follow them by the way LGBT believer this ought to be to your shame those people don't have a problem in the world getting people to send them checks and support them doing the work they're doing what's wrong with us right got news for you Kenneth Copeland is a billionaire. And he's the biggest false prophet that ever walked the face of planet earth. But he can get up and preach LGBT people into hell. And preach them into all kinds of suicidal mindsets. And you know what? He's got tens of millions of people who write him checks to help him do what he's doing. Let me try to get one person in the LGBT community to help write a check to help us do what we're doing. And they'll tell me right to my face, go screw yourself. Some of us have put these lying so-called apostles to the test. We've measured them. The Word of God said concerning false prophets, 
by their fruit you shall know them. And we've looked at their fruit, Johnny. And we weren't looking for things that are arbitrary in nature. We were looking for the fruit the Word of God said should be there. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, meekness. Am I telling the truth? Yes. That's the fruit we're looking for. We're looking for what the Word of God said. Now the fruit of the Spirit is. And we're looking for the fruit of the Spirit on these people's trees. And guess what? You don't see any of it on there. You see maliciousness, you see hatred, you see homophobia, you see all kinds of negativity, you see fear. And the Word of God said, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. And yet the entire evangelical and fundamentalist world today is motivated entirely and completely and totally by fear. These preachers, and I will say it, the Republican Party as a whole, use fear constantly, constantly, constantly to motivate their base and to motivate their followers. Oh, be afraid. Oh, they're going to take over our culture. They're going to take over our nation. They're going to make us a socialist nation. Everywhere I turn, I see these people using fear. And the Word of God says, God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Amen, He did. Matter of fact, it tells us He's given us the spirit of love. It tells us He's given us the spirit of power. Well, you know why Donald Trump got elected? Because the Christians in America felt powerless. Oh, really? <laughs> Sounds like you're not walking in relationship with the Lord like you once were. Because God's given us the spirit of love and the spirit of power. Jesus said, but you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost has come upon you. No matter what's going on in Washington, no matter who, no matter who's in the hot seat in Washington, no matter who's running the show, God's church is always empowered. Problem is, we're empowered against sin. We're empowered against unbelief. We're empowered against addiction. We're empowered against disease. We're empowered against bondage. Yes. But instead of fighting those wars, we're too busy trying to win a culture war. Mm -hmm. We're too busy trying to influence our society and force people to live the way we say they ought to live. Got news for you, dummy. The Bible tells us Jesus said, if you think it in your heart, he said, it's as good as having done it in the flesh. He said, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Got news for you, folks. Got news for you, dear fundamentalists and evangelical knuckleheads. Got news for you. You can make every queer in America act straight. You can make every one of them run around like John Wayne looking like they got crap in their britches, you know, <laughs> spitting on the side of the road. <laughs> I'm a man's man. <laughs> What's going on in their heart is still what comes before God. So you're trying to influence people's external behaviors. It's as idiotic and stupid as anything you could ever do. Yep. Yep. That's right. You're not purging what you perceive as sin from the nation. No, you're doing what the children of Israel did when they had made camp and God would rain manna down from heaven and He said, only take enough for what you need today. Don't take any more. Don't try to hoard it. Don't try to keep more than you need. But some of the people of Israel, oh, they thought they were smarter than God and they would take extra Johnny and they would bring it and they would hide it in a little place under their tent because they were so smart. Doesn't matter what God says. I've got a better way to do things. That's how a lot of these so-called Christians today behave. Doesn't matter what God said. I've got a better way to do things. Mm -hmm. And the Lord turns around and said to Moses, there's sin in the camp. There's sin in the camp. What, what, what do you mean, Lord? What do you mean there's sin in the camp? There are people trying to hide their sin. 
But just because they're not sinning openly and in front of everybody doesn't mean they're not sinning. But we've got people in America wanting to try to force people to act the way they think they ought to act. And these people think that they're going to drive sin from the nation. Wrong. Wrong. What you're going to do is you're going to put sin in little pockets under the tent. You're going to make it so that there's plenty of sin in the camp, but now it's kept well hidden. See, some of us have tried these apostles so-called, these great authorities in the church, these men and women who claim to speak for God to the masses of believers. We've tried them and we found their message to be wrong. We found their spirit to be wrong. The Word of God said, Believe not every spirit, but try the spirit to see whether it be God or not. I watch, and I've said this so many times, and some people online are like, Brother, I don't believe your name and name. You're not supposed to do that. Baloney. I watched Kenneth Copeland on television. Oh my goodness, Johnny, I, I'm 54. I was probably at the time about 12. We're talking a lot of years ago, about 42 years ago. And I'll never forget one day my grandmother said to me, she said, have you seen this new preacher? Because back then he was pretty new, you know. Have you seen this new preacher on television named Kenneth Copeland? I said, uh-huh. Now I told you, I've been operating in the prophetic since I was about 12, okay? My grandmother said, well, what do you think of him? I said, I think he's a false prophet. I think he's demon-possessed. I think he's going to be the destruction of the church in America. I think his message is completely contrary to everything in the Word of God. I think if you have a lick of discernment, you can tell that the spirit that's in that man is not the spirit of God. Well, my grandmother wasn't no pushover either, I'm going to tell you right now. And my grandmother said, honey, you just hit the nail right on the head. That's the same thing that I've gotten from him. But he's got millions and millions of followers. Oh, and not only do they watch his show. Oh, he's not like Brother Charles. He gets an occasional letter from somebody telling him how wonderful he is and how wonderful his ministry is. No. No. He's got millions of people writing him checks to make sure he keeps preaching the garbage, the bile, the vomit that he's been preaching for 40-something years. But when you try to get out there and combat the message of those who call themselves apostles and are not, when you get out there and you try to combat the message of those who call themselves saints when in reality they're as evil as Satan himself, when you try to do that work, see how quickly you get support. See how people, how quickly people rally behind you to make sure you're able to do that work. Honey, I'm telling you from personal experience, you're going to be on your own and don't expect one thing different. He said, and hast not born, meaning you haven't put up with this foolishness and has patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. I'm going to tell you, there's been a lot of times along this journey. I've been in affirming ministry now since 1993. It's 26 years. Been a lot of times, Tommy can tell you, when I've come that close to fainting. That a lot of times I've come so close to just giving up and quitting I couldn't stand it. But I'm reminded of a passage in the Word of God that says, If thou faintest in the day of adversity, thy strength indeed is small. And I'm going to tell you something. My God's a whole lot bigger. I'm not going to make my God look small. I'm not going to make my God look weak. I'm not going to make my God look impotent. I'm not going to make my God look powerless by thinking, no. He said, in your weakness, my strength is perfect. So when I was ready to pass out and faint and quit and give up, I'd look up toward heaven and say, Lord, 
I know you've called me to this, so I'm going to need you to put some gas in this engine because I'm telling you, I'm about to run out. And you know what's wonderful about Jesus? He fills the tank. He fills the tank. Hallelujah. He fills the tank. Isn't that wonderful? Amen. And has borne. And has patience. And for my name's sake, has labored. Oh, I'm going to tell you, over the course of the last 20, almost 26 years, you think the devil, I've told you this before, you think the devil hadn't come to me and said, well, you know, if you just tweak your message a little bit, if you wouldn't be so committed to Jesus' name, if you wouldn't be so committed to that apostolic doctrine, if you would quit preaching Acts 2.38, if you'd quit preaching Jesus' name baptism, oh, if you'd just get on line with all these other affirming churches that preach a watered-down, one-size-fits-all message, oh, you can fill up your building, oh, people will write checks to help support you if you do that. Well, the only problem if I did that was I wouldn't be preaching what I know and no one what I preach. Mm -hmm. I wouldn't be faithful to my calling. I wouldn't be pleasing God. I'd be pleasing men. Right. And boy, I'm going to tell you, I'm too stubborn to do that. Can't do that. Can't do it. He said, you've, for my name's sake, has labored. And has not fainted. 26 years later, this ministry is still preaching the apostolic gospel. And we hadn't changed it one way. We're still preaching one God in Christ and Jesus is his name. We're still preaching Acts 2.38 salvation. We're still preaching Jesus' name baptism for the remission of sins according to New Testament teaching. I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God unto salvation. Hallelujah. Listen to what the Lord... I'm, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. I promise. <laughs> Nevertheless, verse 4, Revelation 2. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee. You see, the Lord recognized all this good in the church at Ephesus. But then he said, but that doesn't mean just because there's all this good doesn't mean that there can't still be a problem. See, a lot of Christians, they think that they got a couple good things going in their life that all is well with God. And it isn't always so. Sometimes you have some things right, but you ain't got all of it right. Sometimes you've got some things on track, and yet there'll be other areas in your walk with God that are so far off track it's not even funny. And the Lord said, Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. You're not in love with me like you once were. You don't feel the way you once felt. You, you don't act like you used to act when we first found one another. Remember that old song, I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. Oh my God. But what happened? Love lifted me. Love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. Oh, do you remember, Johnny, when you first got a hold of that message? Amen. Do you remember when you first finally understood the love of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God and the patience of God? Oh my goodness, Woo, it's washing over me right now as I'm saying the words. And I feel like a kid in Sunday school again, learning about these wonderful things. Are you still at that place in your walk with God? Do you still love Him like you did? Amen. In the beginning, are you feeling like you felt in the beginning? How many people, especially in LGBT circles, and there are others, not just LGBT, there are many people who are not LGBT, who also have experienced hardship within the church. They also have experienced negativity within the church. They also feel like they've been pushed out of God's fellowship by people that call themselves Christians in the church. I know we've got 
non-LGBT people. Do you know who the biggest supporters of this ministry are? <clears throat> I could name about four people right now who are the only people who, who step in financially when we really need help. Every single one of them is straight. Linda McGillicuddy, straight. Amy Hall, straight. Am I telling the truth, Booby? Yep. Oh, but a lot of people in our community, they've been maligned and evil spoken of and hurt and bruised and wounded to the point they don't feel like they once did about their walk with God. I'm going to tell you something, children. It's on you to get back where you need to be. Oh, my Lord. I told, I told you the preacher going to tell to you true, folks. It's up to you to find your way back. It's not up to God. It's up to you. The Lord said, hey, you've left your first love. Reminds me of the old story, and I love this old story. I think it's such a sweet illustration of this principle. The old man and his wife, you know, they were riding in their car on Sunday afternoon, driving just through the countryside, enjoying the views, enjoying the scenery, like they had done for 40 years or better of marriage. Boy, Johnny, I mean to tell you, They've been doing this same thing every Sunday for all these years. And the wife is sitting over to the far side of the car, practically pushing herself up against the passenger door. And the husband's sitting in the driver's seat, driving alone. And the wife looks at the old man and says, Why is it we don't cuddle and sit close on the bench seat like we used to when we first used to do this? Why is it we're not as affectionate and as close as we were when we first started dating and courting and got married and started our family? Why is it things are so different today? And the husband looked at her and said, Well, honey, I don't know, but I was driving then and I'm still driving now. I hadn't moved an inch. Whose fault is it? Say, well, it's not my fault. People in the church made me feel, well, I got news for you. It is your fault. Folks, I've told the story about what predicated my coming out. You want to talk about going through some garbage? You want to talk about the church? I'm trying to find the nicest way of saying it. But it's basically taking a whiz and telling you it's raining, okay? Mm -hmm. you, want to, you want to talk about going through some hardship? You want to talk about going through an awful, horrible, horrendous experience and having the church turn on you like you're the most wicked man on the planet? Honey, been there, done it, bought the t-shirt. The only problem is never in my... Well, for a few years I did. I kind of left the church and I... And I did let what the people in the church did affect me. But eventually, like the prodigal son, I came around. And I realized that the actions of people who call themselves people of God does not reflect the heart of the God of the people. You can't let what goes on in the church of God make you think that the God of the church would treat you that way. At some point in your life, you better wake up and realize it is time to have a relationship with God based on God and God alone and get all these other fools out of your life and out of your field of vision. Oh, I'm going to tell you, I get, up and preach. I get dirty letters and emails. I've gotten death threats over the years for doing the work that I'm doing. I've had death threats since I've been in Dallas.
you know what, if I let people, if I let what other people said and what other people feel and think and believe, if I let that garbage into my world, brother, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today, not for a million dollars. Thank God, because if I was waiting on a million dollars, it would never happen. Somewhere along the line, you got to realize, Bill, that God hadn't moved, you have. You can blame all the people in the universe. You can blame everybody in the world for why you're where you're at. But the bottom line is, you're where you're at because you put yourself there. And the only way they can get you back in the right place is you. Lord said, I have somewhat against thee because thou hast left thy first love. Now listen, here are the three R's of love. And I will tell you today, this, these principles literally apply even to a natural relationship between two human beings. So listen closely because these three R's can be very helpful to you. The Lord said, remember therefore... From whence thou art fallen. Remember is the first star. All you got to do is look back. What made me fall for her to start with? What made me fall for him to start with? What made me love Jesus to start with? What made me embrace this gospel and believe this thing in the beginning? Oh, I'm going to tell you, you forget why it all started and things begin to change. Well, I just thought he was the hottest thing on wheels. Well, honey, if that's all you're basing your relationship on, it's a pretty shallow relationship and it's no wonder you're in trouble today. I thought he was the sweetest, the kindest, the gentlest. Now, I'm not... I'm saying all these words and Tommy's sitting back there saying, nope, nope, nope. <laughs> I loved his integrity. I loved his strength of character. I love you see, a lot of people want to believe just because you're LGBT that the only thing you care about is sex and the only thing you care about is physical attraction. And those of us that are living this life know that's a pile of manure. But that's a bunch of crap old life. Because, honey, I'm going to tell you, I've met a lot of people. I lived in New York City for 10 years. I had models, literally, some of the most gorgeous people on the planet, walk up to me and say, take me home and do whatever you want to do with me every which way but upside down. Blah, blah, blah. Literally, I had this happen. I'm not joking. Believe it or not, as ugly as I am, I used to be fairly cute and a lot thinner, okay? And then they talked to me for a few minutes. And I'd say, dear God, this poor boy, the biggest airhead, this kid is so, doesn't have a clue about nothing. And Johnny, I don't care how beautiful they were in the flesh, I was so turned off, I couldn't see straight. Got news for you, the fact they walked up to me and said that turned me off. It did. Because that's not where I was at. That's not what I was looking for. That isn't, that, you know, listen, honey, I can be as kinky and as freaky as the next guy, but that was not what I was looking for. Oh, Pastor, I don't believe you just said that. Well, I did. I'm trying to identify with folks, trying to get people to understand. You know, a lot of times if you say things kind of rock the boat a little bit, there are people out there who all of a sudden they're saying, wait a minute, I identify with this guy. All of a sudden they make a connection. Say, well, he isn't as far away from me as I thought he was in his experience. And, you know, yeah, you know, I'm all about whistling Dixie while swinging from chandeliers naked. I'm all for all that, okay? But I'd rather do it with somebody I'm in love with. I'd rather do it with somebody I care about. I'd rather do it with somebody that I'm more comfortable with than anybody else on this planet. And I ain't interested in doing it with every Tom, Dick, and Doo-Doo that walks down the street and steps in front of my face. So when this person came to me and said this to me, I was turned off immediately just by reason of their approaching me in that fashion. Do you follow what I'm saying today? But what is it? Remember what it is that 
brought you into relationship with God to begin with? Was it a preacher standing in the pulpit preaching the bitterness and the bile and the hatred and the homophobia that you hear today? Is that what brought you in? I doubt it. No, that's what's pushed you away is hearing all this garbage today, isn't it? No, what brought me in was hearing about the love of God. What brought me in was the old Sunday school song. Jesus loves me. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. That's why we ought to sing some of them old Sunday school songs once in a while, even as adults. You know why? It helps us to remember what brought us here to begin with. Because I'm going to tell you, Johnny, that song played a big role in helping me to love the Lord, in helping me to appreciate His love for me. I don't know about you. I don't know what your life experience was. I don't know what your experience in life was. I know what I grew up in, and it felt like a living hell. I grew up literally struggling every day of my life, emotionally and psychologically. I lived with Donald Trump. I'm not kidding. I lived with Donald Trump. I lived with a narcissist who is on the on the cusp of psychopathic. To give you an idea of what it was like when my parents finally divorced, I was about 19 pastoring my first church. And my father came to the church one day while I was setting up, getting ready for service. And all he could talk about was my mother and what a whore she was and what a slut she was and what a this and a that she was. And all these terrible things. And I never, I was terrified of my father. Growing up, I was terrified of my father. He scared the life out of me. He would threaten you. He'd grab you by the shirt and shove you up against the wall four feet in the air. And I'm going to tell you, that scared the death out of a kid. And your head would make an indentation in the sheetrock, honey. He'd punch holes through walls when he got mad. He'd put holes in doors when he got mad. With his fist. And you'd be shaking in your boots. You'd be so scared. And I looked at my father that day and for the first time in my life I found strength. I found something in me that I didn't know I had. And I said, you know what, you old whoremonger? You cheated on my mother every day of your marriage. You played the field. You acted the fool. You made a jackass out of yourself. Now you're reaping what you've sown. Get out of my church. Get out of my face. Don't you dare be the pop trying to call the kettle black. He left all right. Next thing you know, I was getting phone calls from him threatening to kill me. <laughs> Next thing you know, he was following me around town with a video camera, trying to catch me in some sort of a, uh, you know, a uh, compromising. I don't know what he thought he was going to catch. Had people in town telling me how my own father was running around telling them what a charlatan and a fake and a fraud I was. Honey, I've been going through crap since the first minute I started ministry. I grew up in garbage. I grew up in abuse. I grew up in negativity. I grew up with a father that hated his own children, literally. Never acted for a minute like he loved us. Not for a minute. Never one time uttered a word of encouragement to us. I never one time had my father pat me on the head and say, you can do it, it's alright, you can do it. Never one time, Johnny, I guarantee it, not one time. Trying to play baseball, I had a father telling me what a worthless little 
pansy I was and how I threw like a girl. It didn't matter that I could throw a ball all the way across the ball field, uh, Tommy, and it didn't matter who I was throwing that ball to, I would land that thing right in his, he wouldn't even have to move his glove. That's how accurate I, I literally used to be able to throw a ball. I could throw with such accuracy it wasn't even funny. I'd be throwing all the way across the field. Never one time did somebody have to jump up and try to catch a ball I was throwing to them. Nope, I'd lop that thing right in their lap. But it didn't matter that I had such accuracy because after all, I snapped my wrist, he said, when I threw it. And that was a faggot. That was a queer thing to do. Don't tell me. Don't tell me about hardship pushing you away from your first love with the Lord. I'm going to tell you, if it wasn't for my walk with God, I'd have killed that man by the time I was ten. If it wasn't for the Holy Ghost in me from a very early age, I'd have been so swallowed up by anger, literally, that I don't doubt for one minute that I'd be in prison somewhere right now. I don't doubt it for one minute. If it wasn't for my walk with God, if it wasn't for those little Sunday school songs that reminded me that Jesus loved me, this I know. Yeah. If it wasn't for knowing that he saw and understood and loved me when my own father couldn't. I know why I loved him. I know why I loved the Lord. I know why I came into relationship with him. And I got news for you, honey. I've never forgotten. That has never been lost on me. I remember every day of my life why I love the Lord. Because I know what could have happened. I know what I could have been. I know the road I could have gone down. But the first step to walking in love and walking in relationship with God or anybody else on this planet, you got to remember where you started. Why did I even start a relationship with Jesus to begin with? Why did I even start a relationship with Johnny to begin with? Why did I even start a relationship with Tommy to begin with? Why did I even first fall for Bill? Want to get where you used to be? Just remember, where'd you start at? What were the motivations at that point and at that time? The Lord said, remember. Oh. And then he said, and repent. Repentance is not about saying I'm sorry. Repentance literally means to turn around or to change position. Well, I remember when we first come together that it was like this, and it's not like that anymore. I remember, you know what? I, 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 need, I need to go back to doing things the way I used to do things. I need to. Lord, I, I need to go back. I've got to change my position. I've got to change my thinking. Am I telling the truth? That's repentance right there, folks. But repentance... The Word of God said, faith without works is dead. Repentance that is not immediately followed by action is worthless being alone. And the Lord said, lastly, said, remember, repent. And then the third R of the three R's, he said, and do the first works. What does that mean? It means repeat. Three R's. Remember. Repent, repeat. I used to buy flowers for Booby every payday, didn't I, Booby, when we first met? Oh, I'm going to tell you, that won me some points. I wonder why, you know, I don't get as many smoochy smoochies and <laughs> huggy huggies as I used to. Well, am I still bringing home flowers on payday? Well, no, but you can't blame me. I don't have paydays as, as 
consistently as I used to. Do you follow what I'm saying? Remember, repent, change your mind, change your attitude, and repeat. Get back to doing things the way you used to do things and see if things don't get back to where they used to be. What about you believers today? Oh, I'll tell you what, I used to love to be in church. I grew up in church, and I used to love to go to church because I'm telling you, whoo, the power of God, the presence of God, the, the joy of the Lord that was in the house of God, it was so different than the hell on wheels I grew up in. I'm telling you, the church, when they call it a sanctuary, they weren't kidding. For me, the church of the living God was a sanctuary. I love to go to church. You know what? I'm 54 years old. I still love to go to church. If I could find a church that I could go to and not have to sit through and listen to hours of garbage and crap and foolishness and condemnation and guilt mongering and fear mongering, if I could find a place Johnny, that I could every day of the week visit and be edified and fed and refreshed in my soul, I would do it in a flat second. I would do it in a flat second. When the Church of God used to have camp meeting, we had camp meeting twice a year, church services all day long for a week. Ooh, brother. You couldn't tear me away from camp meeting. Church, back in the old days, we used to have revivals. Every night for a week or two, you'd have church. Man, I'm telling you, I'd be there every night. I wasn't there one or two nights. I wasn't there three out of five nights. I was there every single night. Some of you watching online, you say, I know what he's talking about. That's how I used to be. Remember? Remember how good it was? Remember how it helped you? Remember how edified and strengthened and encouraged and inspired you felt? Uh, remember, now repent. Realize that doing things the way you're doing it now is not gleaning the same results as you gleaned back then. And then lastly, repeat. Do the first works over again. The three R's of love.